started and I know that I think we are the last panel going to do and freedom. So we won't take, uh, we'll keep it crisp. Uh, but I think we have a power pack, you know, full house here today and a very good representation all the way from funds to exchanges, uh, you know, exchange investment platforms to accelerators to enterprise investment platforms. So I'm very excited about it. So I think um, what we can start with is quick intros and maybe we can start with a Kamlesh and go all the way here. So why don't we start with quick intros? Maybe like what, what your the enterprise does, why what not? is your investment thesis and so on. Why not? Hi. Uh, and this is Kamlesh Nagwal. I am co-founder at Facebook Capital. Uh, and we are early stage VC fund, more focusing on the uh, enterprise web3 and uh, fintech companies not especially looking for the crypto and uh, nft kind of companies and my previous background i was a cto of one blockchain startup earlier and uh, lead the hyperledger india and advisor to few companies especially in uh, cbdc and uh, fintech hello i'm shonak uh, i'm the head of web3 for brink uh, been in the blockchain space for more than 10 years now. Uh, at, at Brink, we are a venture accelerator. We've been around since 2014. Uh, we've done more than 50 investments in Web3. Uh, my thesis is on uh, Bitcoin space, uh, deep pin, cloud computing, and GPU compute. That's the spaces I'm really focusing on and very excited about. Hello, uh, my name is Darshan Jain. I'm the founding partner of Sun Icon Ventures. It's an early stage VC based out of Mumbai. Uh, we are sector agnostic as a fund, but we try investing in tech based companies that are looking to cause a di disruption. Uh, from an educational background point of view, I'm an engineer. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm Parth. Uh, I'm with CoinSwitch Ventures. So it's a corporate VC arm of CoinSwitch. Um, and basically the idea is to support the Indian Web3 ecosystem. So we've been doing early stage investments, pre-seed seed runs, and also opening up like, you know, the Indian ecosystem to global capital. So we've created like a very strong partner VC network where we're trying to get in like, you know, bigger funds interested in Indian deals. Hi, I'm Lohit. I'm from CoinDCX and CoinDCX Ventures. CoinDCX, we are a centralized exchange and Ventures is its venture arm. We do invest early stage uh, only in Web3 and invest globally. Hi, this is Ravi Shravastav. Uh, I represent Leo Capital here. What we, uh, again, uh, similar to what some of our friends are doing, we are a broad based technology uh, seed investor. Uh, Web3 is one of the focus areas that we, that we invest in. Uh, broadly speaking, we invest in um, enterprise B2B SaaS, we do fintech, we do some gaming, logistics. So it's a broad gamut uh, that we are focused on primarily at the seed and sometimes pre-seed stage. Awesome. awesome. And very quick intro, so I'm from Borderless Capital. Uh, we are currently deploying from three vehicles focused in deep in uh, cross-chain uh, infrastructure space and third is a liquid. So I think with that, why don't we jump into, uh, you know, I think very different perspectives. So maybe we can start with you, Ravi, on, from your lens, what are some of the trends which of you are seeing in the web space or the investment space in general and, and for this coming cycle? Sure, sure. But so in terms of trend, I know in the previous panel, there was a significant discussion around uh, uh, a couple of things that I, that I noticed, common threads. One is the ETF launch, which has been a catalyst for uh, the price action, uh, right? Uh, let me add just a little bit of color on, on that. Um, ETF launch in the US, um, that was a highly anticipated event. The assets under management, so for, um, it's a very small anecdotal data point, but uh, for the, the BlackRock ETF, right? And, and Rohit, you would know this very well. Uh, it went to $10 billion in under two months of launch. Now, and it broke some records. Um, and guess what the record previous was? It was the gold ETF, uh, which had taken a little over two years to hit that same milestone. So that, that speaks a little bit about the, about the velocity with which now the industry is moving. Um, the second, um, the trend that we are seeing, and, and again, just like previous panelists, you know, it's not really about the price action, it's about what validation it brings into the, into the space. Uh, that has been great. I think a lot of the questions around uh, 
uh, you know, this is a great power sink or, or it is for nefarious actors. All those questions have been subdued actually uh, in the last year or so, but certainly after the, the ETF launch. So it has uh, fairly legitimized the, the industry um, in some senses. Uh, the, the second uh, part that I was again uh, listening to the previous panel about, about compliance and regulation, right? So we have uh, uh, multiple countries looking at you know, compliance. Of course, there was a lot of discussion. I'm not going to repeat that um, around India and how the Indian government is looking at it. Uh, th th there are certain very specific, so Europe is a little bit ahead. It's not the best one, but the weaker regulations came out and uh, it at least sets a path forward. It gives you know some light at the end of the tunnel in terms of um, here is an asset class, here is a new technology. We are all going to interact with it in some way, shape, or form. Um, and and here are the you know the basic guardrails around it. Again, so that's that's an increasing trend, uh, if you can call that. Uh, most most countries are going to have some sort of regulation around it, um, which is which ties a little bit again the CBDC space. You know, perhaps uh, I think a large majority of countries. Uh, are looking at CBDCs in some way, shape, or form. Right? So to experiment with it, whether or not they will launch one is a different um, aspect. Uh, but nearly, you know, 90 plus percent of the world's GDP today is, is actually involved in, in some way, shape, or form uh, uh, reviewing that technology. Um, so, so that's an increasing trend again. Governments are very closely looking. You know, 19 out of the top 20 uh, G20 um, countries have have very close, you know, some sort of pilot, some sort of uh, you know angle to a CBDC today already. So, so regulatory, I think, uh, tailwinds, if we may say, uh, are an increasing trend in, in the space, right? I mean, so it's, it's a, and again, in the past, it's been, it's been very difficult. US, fortunately, unfortunately, is still, you know, uh, they, the kind of uh, regulating by, by um, a, 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 a litigation in some senses. Um, uh, and there are some more uh, regulations coming out. The Congress is, is considering a stable coin. Um, uh, bill that might get passed in in some fashion later this year. That will be a big boost to to USD based table coins, uh, which by the way are, are becoming very you know fundamental in terms of how how capital and tokens move around the the crypto ecosystem. So that'll be a very positive sign as well. Um, so that is but that is more on the on the on the broader crypto uh, you know, trend space. I think uh, a few things in the Web three you know DeFi space or or let's say. Um, the token build-out space uh, that, that we are seeing again is, I think we are at this inflection point, to borrow the term again from previous panelists, uh, we, we have uh, infrastructure that is almost ready. Now, last year we were here, and Rohit, you remember we were talking about, you know, a lot of the uh, inputs are going into infrastructure building and so on. It is not perfect today, uh, but I think a lot of the entrepreneurs in the space spent a fair bit of time during the downturn, you know, uh, heads down building it. Um, and today, I think we're seeing sparks of application layer built on top of, of the uh, infra uh, uh, built out that has been out there. Uh, things like, you know, let's say icon layers are making it extremely easy to, you know, to, to have security uh, posture from the Ethereum underlying layer right out of the box, for instance. You know, this is one example, which so you don't have to build out and worry about the, the entire security layer and still can, can innovate on top. Um, or, or, you know, small projects like uh, there, there's Sonic where you can actually take these, uh, you know, you can use AI uh, to build out these, you know, the content, but then how do you prove provenance of these content? You can put it out on the blockchain, um, upload it to Spotify for consumption, and then you can, you know, you can get paid as a creator for having created that particular piece of, uh, of music. Uh, so some of these are very interesting. Um, and I'll stop there. Maybe just one last thing about about AI that I mentioned. Uh, you know, AI has been you know, the rage all the rage last year, year and a half. Um, but that is a very centralizing technology, so to speak. We can talk more about that later. But uh, there is a you know we feel the crypto Web three space works as a, as a decentralizing you know, counterbalance to that. Um, and that has, uh, the, the variety of ways that we can do that: prove provenance, prove incentives, or, or allocate incentives. Um, so, so I think that's another trend that's increasing. It's kind of on, you know, going hand in hand with the AI or, or Gen AI boom. Uh, but I think that's going to be very important going forward as well. <clears throat> You're talking about in key investment teams, uh, the cycle. Investment teams, and from your lens, how do you see this year play out? Sure. I mean, the second question is easy to answer. We're clearly in a bull cycle, uh, at least until the end of this year. Who knows about next year? 
but some investment themes uh, that we're excited about one is of course restaking uh, a lot of interesting activity happening there a lot, lot of creativity a lot of um, innovative startups starting in that space related to that is the data availability layer so restaking and data availability are two themes that we're very excited about um, other than that i think another space uh, which is, which kind of came at us from the left field is bitcoin l2s so there is a massive amount of innovation happening on the bitcoin l2s and uh, I think uh, Bitcoin L2, some of them are already out, they're in the testnet phase and I think they are a very realistic probability and I think for certain use cases, Bitcoin L2s may actually do better than uh, ETH L2s or the uh, Alt L1s as well. So those are some themes that we're excited about. And other than that, there is innovation across the board. Uh, totally agree on the first part, like in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the market is in a bull run and there is a lot of exuberance back. Uh, I think the meme coin pump that happened in the last two weeks is a clear sign that, you know, a lot of people who made money in BTC are probably rotating into these altcoins and meme coins. So that's something that we'll see. I think it's going to be a highly volatile year uh, for crypto, but uh, post all time highs, um, I think the halving event is going to be like a major, uh, you know, trigger for what happens next. Uh, Ethereum also is going to have its own separate, um, you know, interesting period after the Duncan upgrade next week. So excited about the market structure in general. Um, on in terms of investment theme, so we look across Web3 and I think now we've reached that stage where uh, onboarding people is not that much of an issue. Like in the last cycle, getting new users was tough, chains couldn't handle traffic. Uh, now I think both these problems are sort of, uh, you know, almost near completion. And now we'll start seeing uh, masses get into the space. So I think one of the big triggers for that is going to be gaming. Uh, Web3 gaming uh, always lacked in terms of gameplay, uh, if you see it to like, you know, normal games. But some projects from two years back are now launching their AAA games. Um, GTA 6 is supposed to come out like next year. All of this is going to be like a big trigger uh, for the Web3 gaming space. And other like uh, projects which are non-financial uh, in the sense that they um, reward you for engagement or they reward you for uh, you know viewership I think those kind of themes can also really pick up uh, because crypto enables it like uh, the underlying blockchain technology can enable such uh, new creator economies so the social fi space uh, gamify space these are two things that I'm really like bullish on um, infrastructure continues to like you know keep getting built uh, I think Duncan upgrade will really help other layer tools as well to uh, really bring down costs and speed up transactions. So I, I think from an infrastructure point of view, we'll be in a very safe space to compete with Web2 in this year sometime. And that is when the real explosion of like users comes on board. Um, one sector that I'm really uh, personally interested about is privacy and security. I think one trend that we have seen in India in the past 10 years have been, you know, uh, with the increase in amount of uh, internet, for example, that's available to everyone. We've seen the amount of data that has become digital. And suddenly we see so many organizations that actually care about what kind of practices are around data. Um, so similar to how we have regulations around, in, for instance, GDPR, we see DBDBA also come up in India. And I feel any kind of, for instance, an idea that can help in help organizations in making sure that they're being compliant um, and kind of somewhere around that theme will potentially make a big impact and I would also agree with uh, Ravi what he mentioned about regulations uh, because I think you always want to be on the right side of it and even as Park mentioned about infrastructure focusing on scalability particularly at this point of time um, even if you're building on uh, for layer two instance will be a uh, very interesting space. I think everyone's covered most of the spaces we're interested in, but me personally, I'm very, very deeply in in interested in the Bitcoin space, surely because of the size of it. Now for so many years, it did not have smart contract functionality. That's why it was all this untapped potential. So usually when you're building out building out a product in a particular sector, we look at the TAM and then we go down to figure out your song. Now, if your TAM is Bitcoin, that's a very, very big market to work in. So that's some, that's a space purely just 
uh, from an investment point of view, I'm really interested in. But other than that, every year there's a theme to Web3. Now this year's theme is move as much of computation and data off chain as possible. The CEO of Farcaster has put it really delicately that putting everything on chain is undesirable and unwanted. So figure out if it is really required and only put that much on chain. So I think uh, already most of things covered, but uh, what we are looking. So uh, we are actually mostly work with the startups where we technically and business wise can help because we come from the technology background. Uh, myself is a CEO of the previous company and my another found founder and partner has a huge experience in the industry, BFSI to the tech. So, so the companies where we work, we try to find out whether we can help with them not, not just money, but about in terms of scaling their business. So the current theme we are currently working with uh, some digital asset or some tokenization of fund or uh, okay, CBDC, offline CBDC, which is emerging. But obviously there is a need because the RBI and the all central governments in the world is promising the applicability out. So, so the startup we are building in this area and where we can help them to get a business, we are looking at. Yeah. And I think one thing, again, given the diversity of the panel, uh, because it's very difficult to get you know folks representing kind of this diverse area of Web3 together. So one thing which I think will help the audience is maybe, um, Kamlesh, we can start from you. For each of you, you know, maybe with an enterprise mindset, how are you looking at now, right now, from an enterprise mindset, you know, the startups which are happening, maybe again some key hits or misses, and, and what are you seeing from your lens in the Web3 space, from an accelerator mindset, from a fund, from the exchange viewpoint, and again from a fund viewpoint? So actually, I started my blockchain journey with Enterprise Blockchain itself. So as a part of the IBM blockchain team in 2016, I started as a developer on that time to build solution and use case from the, from the day one in the blockchain space. So I see the, the growth of the ecosystem. Maybe in the media, we more talk about the Web3, crypto and other stuff. But, but technically, there is a lot is happened during the last eight years. I even seen the companies who even went to Series A level. Even yesterday, there is one company called Indicio. They are used the hyper ledger. Indie is a firmware. They recently raised around 20 to 30 million dollars as a series of funding. And it's not a crypto, it's simply how you can uh, solve the uh, verifiable credential ecosystem using the blockchain. So, so this kind of use case is, I know some CBDC platform companies in early, but they already have a 20, 30 million valuation. So, so this question and and use cases around agriculture or the supply chain traceability. Even we seen some failed startup like we we dot and trade lens. Maybe use the data governance and others. But obviously there are ecosystem is there and there are many use cases happening. Even I working personally on a couple of projects of consulting and advisor to them where we are trying to solve the root cross root cross ecosystem in the, in the traceability of the let's give product traceability. So this kind of use case happening and. Uh, I think this is, and I, I believe in going to be next five years, we see the more use cases around the enterprise blockchain. We, other people differ, but they are personal belief. So from my background and my experience, I've run a lot of companies in like all those gimmicky businesses. Okay, anything that was in trend, investors were happy about, I was building that. Those did not work out. Then I went into building a really boring business in uh, uh, in commercial real estate, which is like a prop tech and fintech mix, damn boring. I used to get bored, but that did really well. I got an exit. It turns out it works really well. That's where the money is made. Since then, I'm really looking for companies that are not in hype, that maybe nobody cares about, users would never know about, that are actually able to make money, that are actually able to capture value. Sometimes a layer would not be able to make money, but it's actually capturing value. Rollups will never make money. So that they cannot capture value, but it's like the thing that everyone's going to invest in. So I'm looking for those businesses where there's a potential that even if they don't raise the next round, they would still be able to at least get me a 10x return, if not 100. Um, 
from my perspective in terms of certain hits and misses is what i would answer um certain best investments that we've made have particularly focused upon uh, there have been few that have been focusing on infrastructure where they want to make sure they can be scalable as a system uh, there have also been a few in the metaverse space that kind of allow other companies that are traditionally in the web 2 space to enter into web 3 um we've also seen certain companies that are kind of focusing around the privacy and security that as earlier spoke about um in the supply chain space or in the agitech space as well um but at this point it's kind of early to tell if they'll be hits or misses as a part of a corporate vc it's a very different lens that we apply in terms of uh, making the investments i think primarily the goal of the fund is to grow the ecosystem in india and that's how like we are like you know structured ourselves a little more collaboratively compared to like let's say rest, rest of the industry like i share deal flow with over 150 vcs um, then this is network that has been set up in the last like one and a half years uh, we started off like you know with uh, Uh, about seven VCs who were also our investors, and uh, we said that you need more eyeballs on early stage Indian projects. Um, there was a lot of tourist money in the space. I think in the last uh, bull market, which left like a lot of Web two funds who had started dabbling into Web three, they have also started coming back now. So I think this cycle will be different in that sense that uh, we'll have more uh, uh, long term money enter the space. and we want to be you know the channel partners for them to discover like good projects uh, in the country building has not stopped um, i would say uh, one and a half years we've talked to over 400 projects in the country who are building in web3 so easy to say that with our developer strength um, india is already the third largest web3 developer market if the right kind of you know uh, venture capital or like you know uh, in general like you know liquidity enters the space we can create some uh, world beating companies here Uh, <clears throat> from our perspective, also being an exchange, um, you know, two things. One, completely echo our thought around supporting the ecosystem growth in India. But beyond that, even when you think about global protocols, you know, any time a global protocol wants to enter India, and no global protocol will be able to ignore India in the times to come. You know, a couple of years they will have to come into India for one reason or the other. We do have the largest retail crypto base in the world. It is going to be one of the largest. Uh, crypto markets in the world, and at that point, when these global want to protocols want to tap uh, the Indian market, then who better to partner with than one of the you know leading kind of exchanges, uh, which is why we are focused on not only Indian protocols and Indian builders, but also global protocols because we see that uh, Web three in general is much more borderless than Web two was. It's a lot more um, you know international than Web two was. So you know we're just being a little bit more flexible. Uh, Um, actually, so we have a, a, a few. I'm sure there's lots of misses actually, and I'm happy to talk about that. I, you know, how many <laughs> hours you got? But um, in terms of uh, so what Darshan also mentioned, I think about uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are uh, there is one company, for instance, and I'll take that as just an example, and and uh, build out on top of it. This is a company called Z. We we invested uh, two and a half odd years ago. Maybe three now. Um, they were helping, you know, set out um, node operations for different corporations or or different, uh, you know, projects as they were coming online. Um, you know, again, this infrastructure layer uh, that you want to be able to plug into and not have to, you know, worry about the entire security or or the you know the cycles and so on and so forth. Um, that has done well, and I think businesses like those have generally done well. Um, again, the new cycle now they are, you know, they. Building on top of the node operations, they're adding rollups uh, to their mix of uh, product line that they have. Uh, again, from a very, very uh, you know basic infrastructure level that you can plug in and and start building on top of it. Uh, so those companies, I think, we continue to be excited about. Uh, although now, going forward, uh, we think that we will have uh, more of this. What I said before, uh, a boom in applications. Uh, there's one company, and I wouldn't call it a pure um, Web3 company, but uh, it's it's a gaming company, real money gaming company, and one of the primary use cases today for them is uh, is crypto trading based games, um, and that has done extremely well across uh, the globe. It's still very very early days. Uh, it's called trading leagues. Uh, they are you know the goal is to actually educate 
uh, about financial markets. And uh, surprisingly, when we talk about uh, Web3 and crypto uh, being very early and not many people uh, you know, aware of it, but actually, if you look across the globe, even um, you know traditional financial markets, there's not as much participation as there could be. So, so taking that broad example and and educating the masses about this asset class, uh, not just crypto but maybe equity asset class, uh, taking a gaming approach to that, I think that is one application that we're very excited about. Um, in terms of misses. Um, uh, uh, again, there, are bunch. there was one that I had made an investment actually I missed um, in, in this company called Bitwise. I ended up making an investment in their fund instead of coming from the asset manager itself. Uh, and we feel, again, they've, they've done really well. They've been one of the leading asset managers for uh, within the Web3 crypto ecosystem. Uh, very dedicated asset manager in the space. Uh, so that space also we are excited about. Generally speaking, we're seeing a few. Um, uh, you know, and to the past point, I think there is a, there is a new generation of folks who will come in and, and invest in the space, even if they don't participate on a very you know granular level. But they will say, okay, let me let me allocate some capital and see how it grows. So that in itself is a use case. Uh, you know, people say speculation is a use case, you know, investment is a use case of crypto, and I think that will continue to grow. So investing in perhaps asset managers, uh, if you find the right opportunity, that's something. Awesome. Awesome. And so I think we are also coming to time. So maybe I'll ask one more question to everyone and then we we'll open up for, for any questions. Oh, yeah. so, so I just want to get a quick show of hands. How many founders in the room? Okay. And okay, so I think one question I want to ask specifically to the founders. So maybe again for each one of you starting with you, Ravi, is uh, when you are hearing the pitch. What is it that you know sometimes makes you feel oh my god I want to invest here? And what is it that makes you feel like oh, this is a red flag? Yeah. Uh, I think gosh, there is um, this is a question that we deeply think about all every day actually. Um, so in terms of let me say um, what makes us super excited, and of course, you know, there, there's the founder market fit and there is, you know, have you thought about the problem? Um, deeply enough, have you, you know, have you uh, learned enough that clearly you should have, you should be, you should be educating me in the room, right? That's my goal. I should be in the, in the seat where I'm learning from the founder. Uh, but predominantly, there is typically an entrepreneur, you know, when they, this is this, this sign of seeing the future, and this is very cliche, right? But are they seeing the future? Are, are they saying that this is how it will end up being? Uh, rather than saying that, oh, we we'll try this, we we'll try that, you know, the paths can differ and they will surely differ. But in terms of the goal or the problem that they're trying to solve, um, that should be, you know, very, very clear. Uh, and we've seen time and again, if, you know, anytime you've compromised on that, um, uh, for, for one reason or another, um, that investment hasn't gone very well. So it's a clear sign. Uh, in terms of what uh, pulls us away, Again, I think if it's, um, you know, and Web3 space has, has been criticized in the past for this, um, you know, like a, a hammer looking for a nail, right? It's just, I have the solution, where can I apply it? I think that that approach, even though you might actually find the right nail and you have the right hammer, but the approach of looking for the nail because you have the hammer, um, I think that you know, pulls us away from that approach. It's, it's really have you identified the right nail, the, you know, the right depth it has to go to, and why it is important. What picture are you hanging on that nail, and therefore you need to build this handle. I think that's very important. For us. Um, I think there are some table stake things that every VC looks at. You know, it's the quality of the founder, the size of the problem statement. So those are table stakes, right? There's no getting away from it. Beyond that, I think what excites me is a unique intuition or a unique insight that typical people don't have or, uh, or at least I wouldn't have. So that's certainly one thing that excites me, a unique insight or intuition, that's number one. And number two, what I find missing, especially amongst Web3 founders, to be very honest, is a view of the competitive landscape. Now, Web3 is uh, global by its very nature and it's, it's way more competitive than Web2. You know, there could be a fantastic team building a very similar product somewhere you know, in a small corner of the world, but you need to be aware of that. Um, and I find that Web3 founders don't do the enough diligence from a competitive landscape point of view. So those are two things that stand out for me, which is a unique insight or an intuition, or, and number two, especially in the Web3 space, 
being aware of the competitive landscape. And similarly, if they don't have these two things, then I'm going to be less excited. Yeah, totally. I think uh, early stage investing is more art than science. Like there are four broad things that I looked at, like uh, from the team, uh, TAM, team, and probably tech. Like if there is a very strong tech mode that comes in crazy innovation. Yeah, and in all these four, I think still the standout is the team. So um, I think both on the positive and the negative side. Positive side, if you know that this founder is trying to build something which hasn't been built before, you must back them. And you get that feeling, you get that sense of Eureka uh, when you see like you know somebody is uh, sort of like front run the wave which might come because of the innovation. So I think there, uh, if you come across somebody who's building that with that spark, you should back them and try to build a uh, you know, case uh, on which other investors will um, similarly, on the downside, I think, and we are now at that point in the cycle where uh, founders start saying no to due diligence questions. So they're like, you are writing a small check, hundred k, we won't do like you know so many details. I think that for me is a clear cut sign that they probably don't know their business that well that they're not ready to answer it, or they're just trying to like you know uh, there is some exuberance in the market like you know where they are getting money for not. Uh, really, the product that they actually built, and which can be like you know, uh, cross question to the point of uh, uh, any investor's questions. And again, like I know, enhanced DD, tech DD are totally different ball games. But we are at this point again where uh, this happened in the last bull market also, where paper ideas used to raise money. Uh, I just hope we don't go down that road. Um, so some great points were covered over there. That I was kind of going to talk about. Um, but to reiterate, I think um, it's very important for the founding team to have complementary skills that kind of help each other out. And what kind of gets me really excited is when the founder comes up to me and provides a great insight, as you know, someone just mentioned. That kind of gives you another idea as to how big or how big a particular idea can be that you don't really know about. And in terms of uh, red flags or even yellow flags are. When you know you just don't answer questions in a simple way, and you try complicating them. And also, for instance, one thing that particularly strikes out to me is if you don't really have a good amount of calculation to support what the market size of your particular idea is. So, like everyone said, we have like standard hygiene measures that we do. We have certain boxes that we need to tick first. Post that, since it's all early stage investments, maybe we don't even have a product, no traction, forget revenue. So we definitely look for a good team and a team that we can also work with. Maybe they have they are a solid team. They have run previous businesses, even if they did not work out. If they have worked out, great. Uh, if it's an obnoxious founder, I will not work with you. Um, and the timing, as they said, timing is very important. So if you are too early or you are too late, you are still wrong. So timing is very very important. So I think um, every founder should know how to say that is most important. Even I am a technology guy, but I give more matters to sales and the adaptive nature of the founder because if he able to learn from his mistakes, because I see many founders like. They believe in the idea so much, but they are, even they are realizing they are not able to convert the business. But it still, be more matters to them whether they are more confident or whether they don't want to accept. So, how to say is more important, and then adapt to the environment. If let's say this product is not working, they should be able to pitch to the pivot. And technology could scale and build later any time. Even like the past it like the paper idea did funding. So with that, it's almost new nature, like how the founders would able to express and how able to sell their product. Awesome, awesome. So I think great, great talks, guys. I think I, I hope that everyone learned for some tips from it, or that we all have achieved to learn from these guys. So with that, why don't we just open it up to the audience? So maybe I think a couple of questions we should be able to squeeze in. Yeah. So um, anybody, just raise your hands and I think we'll go. We take it. There is someone particular you want to direct the question to. You can do it like maybe on the exchange side or the fund side, or you can keep it general. Hi everyone. 
I am a partner in crypto venture studio and we have early stage crypto projects as capital. And what my experience has been in this cycle is that VCs are prioritizing RD exits uh, with a lower than average cliff period. And they are more interested in tokens than equity. Uh, so because they basically want to capitalize on this bull market and recoup a lot of losses for the crypto venture. So my question for you uh, is what are your investment pieces on exits? Uh, what's your healthy timeline for a VC project relationship? And uh, should projects focus uh, on PTEs and IPOs to make uh, money early on or near the actual product development first? Thanks. Awesome. So I think that the, if we got it correctly, the question is basically be on exit, timeline for exit, and should the focus be on uh, PG listing and getting exits? Okay, so, uh, so when we're talking about these companies, you're referring to Web3 companies coming to us, right? So when Web3 companies come to us, they come at a Web3 premium. Okay, that is basically whatever normally we would value a company as, as, well, as soon as they've added the Web3 term, they've added a very high premium to the valuation. And if we have taken the risk of investing in it, we expect a quick turnaround because that's the risk we've taken for that higher valuation. So of course, we will be looking for an exit potential. We are also a business, we are also looking to make profits for our investors. So, uh, to answer your question, yes, we also care about our exits, but it's not quick exits we look for. That depends on the founder. The founder who comes to us, he is the one who decides the tokenomics, how our vesting schedule will be like. We come to an agreement and if the founder has already agreed to a particular vesting schedule that gives me a quick exit, is that on me or is it on the founder? If I can just add one point, like, again, it depends on where you are in the cycle. I think last one and a half years, there were only equity rounds also with token warrants, with no like clear cut tokenomics in place uh, because nobody wanted to launch a token uh, like one year down. One year in the past, like, nobody wanted to do a token. And now the cycles have turned around, everybody wants to launch a token which will probably get like more you know, uh, market cap. And uh, again, vesting schedules are pretty tight, like most of them have like very little uh, amount that is free for selling at PG. And then there's like a linear vesting over like a two year period. So I think uh, as long term investors and strategic investors, we are like in it for at least like a two year time frame if you need an investment. Maybe just to add to that, uh, you know, tokens, I don't think every project should have a token. So a lot of projects come and say that they uh, want to launch a token, but it's not clear if that project should ever have a token. So that is one big question mark in my mind. That said, the projects that do have tokens, of course we love it. You know, it gives us early liquidity because VC is a game where it can take 10, 15 years before you get liquidity. So there are certain projects which gives us early liquidity. Absolutely love it. You know, uh, as they were just saying that, uh, you know, we are in the business of giving returns to our investors and this gives us liquidity. So next question. My question. Hi, this is Paratush. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, enlightening discussion. Uh, my question is uh, really just a venture investment 101 question. So you mentioned uh, that the timing of your investment, when, when you're coming to get your, I mean, get funding for your idea, that timing in the market is very important. So what are uh, some of the markers that someone who's just, you know, starting out uh, looking for funds that he or she should keep in mind to know whether the timing in which they are participating in the round is that timing opportune right whether they are late early so if you could just close in mind any any okay uh, this is in terms of choosing a particular sector to work in uh, based on uh, funding data is that what you're saying that should be pretty easy to aggregate right like you should be able to go to public uh, forums and be able to aggregate that data figure out if the funding is growing or going down you should have a lot of papers up by mckinsey and all these companies put, getting put out you'll get a good sense of idea if funding is on rise or if the market is not doing well whether investors are interested or not this is all public data that's freely available but if you want to know if the timing is right, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, hi. Uh, maybe I can add just a little bit on the, on the timing side. Um, gosh, uh, in terms of um, going out and hitting a certain problem, and both for the founders, 
uh, entrepreneurs and also for, for investing in terms of investing. Uh, being a little bit late is, is slightly better than being too early. So, so that we've seen time and time again, um, uh, especially because we come in at a very early stage of the, uh, of the investment cycle. Um, so many, you know, so many entrepreneurs just lose steam and when they could have, you know, they could have stuck out another three years, the timing would have been better. So, so just keep that in mind. If it feels, so I'll, this is an anecdote, I'll, I'll give you an example, I'll date myself doing that. Uh, in, in 2013, I, I stopped, you know, I came out of the uh, prior high frequency trading uh, work and, and I, I was looking at the crypto space and I had played around a little bit with the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, I looked around and I said, well, uh, there is Coinbase, they had launched already, there's this Coinbase, there is BitPay, uh, you know, and there was one cross-border, you know, currency uh, remittance platform that had come up, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but I looked around and I said, everything has been solved. I, I don't know what I, what I can do in the crypto space anymore. This was 2013, um, right? So, so timing uh, is, is all about uh, having that conviction. And if you're a little bit late, don't, don't fret. You probably better place that place. Uh, hi, I'm Prasad. It's just a general question. General, general question. Uh, why is uh, the startup funding is extremely low now? Twenty-three years, five years low in twenty twenty-three as compared to what it used to be. What is the scenario? Like, you know, is this we are not getting enough good niche startups, or is there any issues like uh, what are you? What are the parameters? The kind of processing your requirement? The kind of looking at. What is the, what has changed? I think it's a very macro thing and it's not specific to Web3. Across the no, board, no, no, VC yeah. funding has like it had reduced a lot. I think it's on the upswing again. That is because of macro factors. When interest rates go higher, risk capital becomes like very like you know averse. You would rather just deploy it in like US Treasuries and get five percent uh, without like you know getting ahead uh, with like a risky proposition and. We, have, we had seen this when interest rates were close to zero, funding was like very much free flowing. I still think there is a lot of cash lying on uh, with uh, these LPs, which wants to be deployed. It is sitting on the sidelines, but, but they're still waiting for, you know, valuations to come to better levels or like in general interest rates. As soon as interest rate gets cut, you will see like another surge uh, in VC funding. That's great. In fact, it kind of uh, ties back into that exit question and, and to your point about uh, LPs right now, everyone is asking about exits, right? Uh, because of the liquidity crunch that has been um, in spaces, broadly speaking. And also, I think there is a little bit of a reflection, self protection around the, the venture space itself. Uh, again, not specific to, to Web3, but venture space, you know, what is the time horizon? Is it worth taking that liquidity risk? Um, so, and, and this is coming from allocators. Um, I think we also uh, stepping back in terms of um, the, the entrepreneurs or managers who deploy the capital. I think there was a little bit of, of um, an exuberance um, in, in you know a couple of years ago. Uh, it just set it down. Right? So if you actually look at pre uh, 2019 you know, 2020 data, uh, we're actually not way too low. We're actually just about mean reverting right now. Maybe in the interest of time, one yeah, one last question, and then you all can you know huddle outside. We'll take one last question. Sure. Okay. okay two, two. Uh, There's two last questions, and then actually we have a flight, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure, I'll make it short. Me. But we'll take two. We'll take two questions. Uh, I'll I'll make it short here. So, uh, myself, I'm Sai. Uh, this is more on the question on the metaverse uh, friend uh, with the uh, investment perspective. Uh, especially like I wanted to understand like uh, the VC, VC mindset when investing in metaverse, uh, metaverse company very much. Do you prefer investing in a token company uh, uh, like uh, a company which has token, uh, gaming token involved or with no token, uh, what are the factors that you look at and should the founder even think of uh, creating an exit strategy or he should be focused on the product itself? Uh, it's open to anyone. Uh, okay, unpopular opinion or hidden opinion. Um, we've actually all gotten really burnt with the whole metaverse narrative, and uh, I'm not sure how fundable it is at the moment, at least in the VC circles, we don't talk about it. 
Metaverse, uh, at least in the Web3 VC circle, Metaverse is no longer Web3. Uh, we have, what do you call it, got ridden of it. It's no longer in Web3. Uh, so it's more on the digital entertainment side. Uh, maybe Jeremy is a good investor in that direction. Uh, we personally are really not looking in the Metaverse side. So if you have a token, great. but whether we'll still see that kind of exit potential or whether we'll still see that kind of VC money flow inside it, I'm not sure about. Um, just one part to add to what he said. I think it would be a better idea to focus on the product and even more on that, on the customers. You know, if you're really to get, looking to get funding, might as well get a strong base of customers who really vouch for your product. And if you're able to do that, then a bunch of VCs will be looking for you. I agree with this point, like focus on the product first. Once you get traction, VC money is going to come in anyways. Uh, tokens, uh, there is exit liquidity, but for what? Like if the token doesn't have any value or like nobody's using the metaverse, I don't think uh, that will add much value. I don't agree with the fact that metaverse is like totally dead. I think still uh, we are, it's a long term play. Um, uh, with Vision Pro and like, you know, uh, such kind of AR, VR, uh, hardware changes coming into play. They will take probably another four years for mainstreaming, but I definitely think that there is going to be a, a, a longer term metaverse play in the future. Maybe one final question. Let's go in the back, please, if you don't mind. Okay. Hi, this is Ratnesh Kumar. Uh, my question is uh, for getting funds. Uh, so, why which began to approach VCs for getting funds and mentorship as the existing platforms for getting investment charges in daily market, though we don't know its reliability? What are the best ways to reach out to VCs and ask for money? <laughs> so, I can say that's yeah. the uh, <laughs> way we hang out. But, but please just reach out to us. We, we answer every email. Just reach out to us. There is, I and mean, of course, if you um, have a warm connect, that's, that's respected, but it doesn't change the odds. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I would just echo that a warm connect always helps. Yeah. Uh, you know, cold reach out sometimes, you know, it can slip through the cracks, but a warm connect always helps. Hello, this is Sanjay, and my daddy consultant and author of the first story. I am uh, just about the law and regulation of crypto and I will talk about it and things like that. So, law and regulations, so how good it, uh, the, the trade goes on in India? I'm talking about the law and regulations. Speak, speak law, uh, I'm talking about the law and compliance of crypto investment and regulations. So, so I think uh, basically India has taken a very uh, slow and steady approach in terms of regulation and uh, it also wants to do things from a global framework perspective. So when India was the G20 presidency, we pushed for like a global set of uh, you know frameworks to be put in place for crypto because not one country can regulate such a global asset class. And uh, I think we will see some more directions in the right step post the elections. Uh, post like you know uh, uh, clarity will probably emerge in the next uh, budgetary session which happens that's from an india perspective globally we have like mica as the north star which is like going to come an eu wide regulation across the european union uh, us also i think probably elections only after the elections we can expect you know some more uh, uh, proper laws and frameworks to be put in place how safe is the inference that's my question how safe is the investment if you invest from India? Uh, it is extremely risky. It is the most risky asset there is. If you are looking for safer assets, there are like regulated assets and you can place your money there. But similarly that you place some money in small cap stocks, I think uh, just for you know risk adjusted returns, you could place some money in the bill. Thank you, thank you. And I will just summarize that by saying that you know when you take a step back, sometimes people get excited or uh, or the other way around. If the minute one regulation comes out, but the reality of the matter is regulations can never front run innovation. You know, that is by its very definition, regulations always have to play a lagging role. Whether it was Flipkart when they started e-commerce, you know, Zomato, Ola, Uber, etc., etc. Regulations always, by its very definition, have to come after the fact, and that's exactly what's happening in the crypto space as well. 
The second point is when you actually take a step back and you think about it from a long term perspective, globally, crypto regulations, the secular trend is trending upwards. We're getting increasingly more regulatory clarity. It is taking a little bit of time, but the secular trend is trending upwards. So that's pretty optimistic. Last question. Wonderful discussion. And generally got an overview of what VCs are looking for. Uh, so we have already built a blockchain-based payment app. And uh, we have a consumer who is ready to pay using cryptocurrency in US. And we have a merchant who want to accept payment in cryptocurrencies. The problem we are facing currently right now is in uh, to find a payment processor like uh, 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 Razorpay or Simple. And the moment we talk about the problem and the business, they are just like, we don't touch crypto. So, like, uh, do you make, uh, do you think, like, what would be the uh, way out here? Yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll also do a real quick plug. To, uh, talk to our portfolio company called Paytree. They should be able to solve so, like, there are basically your problem is on ramp and off ramp. Uh, now, how to get INR into crypto? So, there are like FIU registered like compliant platforms that can help you. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, some of them are like, pretty easily available. You can just go search on ramp, off ramp. You'll get any on ramp is one company, there's on meta, there is transact. All of these are FIU registrations. We, we, are, we have already partnered with Transact, but the problem we are facing we need a payment processor. <coughs> Moon pay, NFT pay. There are a lot of like uh, specific crypto payment companies which allow exactly the access payment processes. They act as razor pay for accepting crypto payments. Okay, it would be a great help. Thank you, guys. I think so. Again, really thank all the panelists for you know, sharing their kind of views here, and I hope it was you know, exciting for all of you.